Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, where we'll be exploring common day-to-day -day challenges in medical device security. And of course, we'll also be discussing practices that can be adopted to better protect those devices. I'd like to thank John Benedict and the Synergist Tech team for our, the great insight he's about to share. A little bit about our presenters before we start today. John is Synergistic's medical device security principal. He's a pioneer in medical device security with nearly a decade of experience in the field. An additional thanks to John for joining us from the airport today as he deals with some flight delays. And my name is Chad Holmes. I'm Scenario Security Evangelist with past focus on product development and security for companies like Accenture, Red Hat, Vericode, and Scenario, and now with a focus on helping uh, healthcare facilities secure their environments and IoT devices. A little bit about Scenario before we start. Scenario was founded in 2018 with a pretty straightforward goal. We wanted to secure every IoT, OT, and medical device in healthcare environments. In 2020, we're, we are identi identified as a Forester Wave leader and a Gardner leader as well, and have recently started to get recognition from our customers in class reports where we routinely score over 95%. So many thanks to our customers who provide those reports. And John, if you want to provide a little bit of information about CTEC. Sure, thank you. Uh, Synergistic has been around since 2001 when Mac McMillan, our, our founder and CEO, brought us uh, around. Uh, we have focused heavily on helping our customers build resilience, uh, you know, finding and identifying their um, opportunities for improvement, prioritizing the risk, and then developing programs and managing them for them. Great. Thank you, John. And we'll talk more about CTEC and what you all do as we go through. So a little bit about our, our presentation today before we jump right in. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges of medical device security, why they've grown so rapidly, and, and what we're seeing. Then we'll talk about a lot of recommendations, particularly those that John has seen throughout the industry on how to better address the ch these challenges. Things like knowing your audience and making sure you're messaging to them correctly, ways to triage and stop active attacks, understanding that inventory is not security. While they're both necessary, we can't take one and not the other. How to enhance your team with offerings like CTEC offers, and then filling the IT and IoT security gaps, first identifying them and actually taking action. Uh, we will be taking questions as we go through. So if you have questions, please ask them in that little question mark box in the top right-hand corner of your screen. We'll try to get to them in real time, but if we can't, we'll make sure to answer them at the end. So starting off, let's talk a little bit about the challenges of medical device security. We've seen great adoption over the last 10 or 15 years or so um, to the point where there are millions and millions across the U.S., it's not un unlikely to see thousands in some of mid, medium and large hospitals. We also know that they introduce much longer life cycles, which is good for optimizing spend, but also can be really challenging when it comes to maintaining them. We're finding that there's a limited expertise. The devices have grown much faster than the human knowledge to keep up with them and, and the training for those humans. And that's all leading to increasing attacks. So John, I want to toss it over to you. Can you hit on a couple of these topics and talk about, you know, first what you've seen for medical device growth within the industry, and then how we've seen some of these challenges start to arise uh, um, throughout that adoption? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that we've seen, or we worked for a long time in healthcare, was building interoperability, um, allowing doctors to be able to access patient records, um, you know, share information uh, back and forth. And so we, we worked really hard to create all of that. And then once we created that, it was about the time WannaCry hit. And we said, well, wait a minute, what do we do now? Uh, we've got these devices that are staying in the environment for 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. And they just really weren't designed or built with security in mind. And so it, it's all bolt on solutions. And, and, you know, what we first started out when security was just putting things behind a firewall and hoping for the best. And we know that no longer works as, as you, you talked about with in, in terms of attacks are increasing and becoming more complex. And once they get inside the network, uh, they're, they're being able to move laterally and, and these things are impacting medical devices. So, you know, keeping that interoperability, allowing us uh, to not impact patient care and still secure the devices and the data is really the challenge that we're trying to tackle today. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit more about the types of attacks you're seeing and what outcomes they're having on healthcare environments as well? So you mentioned water cry, want to cry, you mentioned things bouncing around environments. What it, one, what's the technology driving those attacks? And two, what's the real life outcome that, that your customers are seeing? 
Sure. The, the real life outcome that, you know, for medical devices, it's, it's a really unique space where availability is king. You know, you talk about your CIA triad and in, in banking, it's, it's confidentiality. Um, in other industries, it's integrity, et cetera. For healthcare and medical devices specifically, it's availability. So anything that disrupts a device's availability is just, it, it could potentially harm a patient. It can delay care. And, uh, you know, things that we've seen recently, and I've seen this across a number of different customers, are a resurgence of really old things like configure, um, you know, and, and the questions that we're trying to figure out because of the limitations of the device, you can't really get solid forensics on it. Has it been sitting there dormant for 10, 15 years? I think configure came out, I don't know, 2008 or so. Um, or are we just now seeing it because of, of tools like, like Cinerio's tool where we're just now starting to see more of that traffic and, and what's happening in the behavior analytics. And I don't know what if you're seeing anything like that as well. Yeah, we, we are. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as we go. But old malware, malware that's as old as my career. So about 20 years old at this point, we see in environments routinely because the IT systems that are stood up just aren't designed to, to protect against it. They have a kind of vintage of 15 to 17 years of technology that they try to protect. And everything outside those bounds kind of goes to the wayside. Um, the other thing I want you to dive into a little bit more is the long life cycle. So for hospitals, this is good because these devices come in, um, they get the bang for their buck, right? They get 10, 15, 20 years out of those devices providing patient care. That's outstanding. But it takes a long time to patch them when there are security issues. Um, and if they're not designed with security in mind, that can lead to huge challenges. So can you dive a little bit into why those long life cycles exist and, and maybe some of the challenges your customers are facing around them? Sure. The, the long life cycle exists because, um, as you said, you, know, you can have MRIs that are, are um, you know, $10 million, $5 million for sure, but some of them are upwards of $10 million for the, for the room. And these are not devices you can change out every, every couple of years. So they stick around for a long time um, in order to get the return on investment for them. You know, even things like infusion pumps stick around for 10, 12 years. And, and that's what we need to do in order for our uh, healthcare delivery organizations to be profitable. Um, and so the challenges that that presents is what operating systems were in place 15 years ago. We were looking not just Windows 7, not just Windows XP. We see stuff out there with Windows, you know, NT, Windows 95, Windows 2000. And, you know, trying to trying to secure things like that. Um, is just a, a really huge challenge. I mean, there's just, there's no longer patches that are being issued for them. And if there are patches like WannaCry, very few um, OEMs are actually validating those patches to ensure that they're safe to be put on. So, you know, we, we just, we've got to find other ways outside of at the device level patching to try to secure these devices through network controls and others. Yeah, and, and to really paint that picture, um, Patching one IV pump, one infusion pump, doesn't sound like a big deal. You get the patch, you apply it, you test it, you're good to go. Hospitals don't have one, one infusion pump, right? They have hundreds and, and in many cases, thousands of infusion pumps. And so constantly applying patches, which are already late to the game for, for previously identified vulnerabilities, is really difficult just from a logistical standpoint. And then, as you mentioned, you know, the, the version of Windows those are running on are really important, but as we get into more and more I, IoT devices, Windows is just a small sliver of the operating systems. It's kind of some, around the seven to 10% range. We see a lot of different uh, versions of Linux. We see a lot of uh, kind of homebrew, build your own operating systems there. So the traditional methods that are used to protect that desktop at a nurse's station, for example, simply can't be applied in most cases or, or, or applied in a reasonable way um, to all these devices that are starting to propagate within healthcare environments. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, if I, let me just add there. I mean, you're right. I, the high percentage is a customized proprietary Linux box. Um, and, and the amount of information that we need to be able to protect that is, is difficult and that we could go down the whole road of, of having an S bomb and all that, but let's stay out of that conversation for today. But uh, you know, you've, you've hit it right on the head there, Chad. Yeah, and to be clear, I'm a Linux nerd at heart, right? So big open source guys. Linux isn't bad by default. It's just it's introducing new challenges that protections built for Windows were not meant to, to, to address. All right, so we, we've kind of set the stage of, oh, no, there's a lot of bad stuff, right? We're, we're providing care with these devices. That's great. 
but they're introducing a lot of risks that we just haven't considered wide enough before. So, so let's shift the conversation a little bit into what we can actually do, right? We could sit here for an hour and talk about all the bad things, but let's actually start to provide some guidance. And the first thing I want to talk about is, is knowing your audience, right? Because the way we talk about these challenges in the examples we use, just as an example, um, can drive very different reactions. And so the first thing I like to say is you need to focus on healthcare and not technology. Um, in the healthcare field, care is always the first focus. You know, the bits and bytes don't matter as much as making sure that patient care is optimized and they get the care they need at the right time. And so to help with those discussions, we need to start using industry-specific use cases. And let me give a really good example. I have an incredibly long list of articles where they talk about all these ransomware attacks that are, are, are occurring within hospitals. And then they say, for example, Colonial Pipeline was hit with a ransomware attack in 2021, and they talk about oil and gas. And so if an executive, a healthcare leader is reading that, they say, okay, I'm being told there's issues in healthcare. We haven't been hit yet. And then it talks about an oil and gas pipeline that doesn't quite make sense. So we need to start thinking about, uh, about the discussions in terms of what actually makes sense to healthcare leaders. And that's where we need to use examples like Scripps, where they suffered a ransomware attack and took out their system of 19 or 20 uh, uh, locations for a month and cost them over 100 million. University of Vermont saw the same. They were out for about a month and it cost them over 60 million. So focusing on the healthcare environment is incredibly critical. And, and John, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Well, the old expression is walk a mile in someone's shoes, right? And, and in order to really understand the problems we're trying to solve, you, you have to get in and walk a mile in a, a healthcare delivery organization's shoes, in a biomed shop shoes, and understand that their challenges are keeping the devices up and running, keeping them available for use when they're needed by a patient. And so, um, you know, presents challenges where we having a zero trust environment is very difficult because we can't just block by default and see who screams and cries because it could cost somebody delayed care and, 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 you know, injury. You know, the, the other thing that I learned a long time ago in one of my cyber classes is when, you know, cybersecurity or security in general interferes with business process, cybersecurity is deemed to be in the wrong, right? And so you have to understand these things and you have to figure out how do, how do we provide a more secure environment? How do we keep the patient safe first? How do we keep their data safe second and not interfere with, with day-to-day -day workflows and, and clinical workflows that happen? And so there's a lot that has to happen there to do that. And it's not just technology to your point. You have to understand the clinical workflows. You have to understand what devices are supposed to talk to, what they're trying to talk to, why they're trying to do it. And, and I know you've got a few features we'll talk about later that do a great job there. Uh, but yeah, you absolutely need to understand what we're trying to accomplish and, and what the providers are trying to accomplish in order to help them, you know, help enable them to achieve those goals. Yeah. And I think one, one great example of this is cybersecurity is really heavily invested in, in things like investment banking. So the Goldman Sachs of the world and insurance agencies. And what we're seeing is more and more people that were working in, in those fields are coming into healthcare because there's just a better mission there. But they, they make the mistakes of thinking that the Goldman Sachs environment, just as an example, is going to be the same as a healthcare environment. And, and there's always a couple rough few months as you readjust your expectations on how to speak and what to speak about. So it, it's a common trend. Um, it's a good one overall because we're getting more talent, talent in healthcare. But it's one that we all need to work together to, to get those new joiners to, to think more in terms of healthcare and understand the business a little more. That leads in uh, to this next subtopic, which is speaking the language of, of healthcare IT. And you, you led into this a little bit where you said, walk a mile in the shoes of a biomed engineer. A lot of people don't realize it unless they've experienced it. But within healthcare environments, IT and security, um, it's not unusual to have a somewhat tense relationship with, with biomeds, right? The biomeds are out there trying to keep these machines functional and up and running, and they are they're receiving continuous tickets from the IT team. So can you talk a little bit about the dynamic we see there and, and kind of how you can help ease uh, um, the natural tension that exists in those environments? Sure. I mean, you, you have to, um, again, you have to, you have to demonstrate that you understand their goal is to keep the, the equipment up and running because it's very easy for that miscommunication to start happening where they feel like you're trying to block them from connecting their devices or a physician feels that way. Um, and it's also very easy for them to see security as, as kind of an obstacle. So what we need to 
to do is, is kind of pivot that message, change the paradigm a little bit into, no, we're trying to keep the devices safe so they are up and running. And no, we're not trying to burden you with tickets, but there needs to be a marriage there. And, and I think we talked a little bit once before, you know, I could go apply a patch, right? That's not, that's not really difficult on very many devices. But what I don't know how to do is reboot an MRI or reboot a patient monitor or an infusion pump and run it through its paces and make sure that it's functioning normally and suitable for patient use. And so we, we've got to find that compromise to where, to where people understand there are things that, you know, a security person just can't come in and do, right? And, and that's why those biomeds are just so important because I, I, I couldn't begin to tell you if a device is functioning and fit for patient use, but I can't install the patch. Um, so, you know, we need them to understand this is not to block you. Uh, this is to enable you and keep that device up and running because one thing that we've not been doing a good job with the message is if a device is down due to a cyber attack, a virus, an infection, it's just as unusable as if the power cord itself is cut. Um, it, it's just as dead for patient use. And so coming coming alongside of one another to be able to, to walk that mission together, uh, I think is really the, uh, one of the things we've, we've struggled with, right? I've, some of the organizations I've worked for that do the clinical engineering work, that's always been the struggle is to support them and not make them feel overwhelmed um, and, and help them understand they do have a vital role that we can't sub out for them. And then we just need to, um, you know, build those playbooks and run books so that we each understand the handoffs that take, take place. Yeah. And that paints a pretty clear picture of the question of who owns security it might seem really easy to answer up front. The IT team has security within it, but in reality, everyone owns security, right? Biomeds, for example, have to apply those patches, but they're also this great last line of defense. If something goes wrong, they're right there at the device level. And that's the last line of defense that most industries don't have. So, so moving on from this part, I do want to kind of, we've talked about biomeds. Let's talk about the people two or three steps above them. And how do we actually motivate leadership to take action because i think any leader you talk about in a healthcare environment they're going to say cybersecurity is a top two top three kind of focus the problem is while it's a focus and while it's a concern actually taking action can be incredibly difficult for a variety of reasons price resources where to start etc and what it comes down to is that prioritization and then both actionability and achievability are major problems they, they simply don't know where to start so when it comes to motivating action, when you're talking to leaders on a daily basis, you know, where do you point them to start? What do you recommend they focus on? The good news is we no longer have to educate, as you said. A few years ago, we were on a mission to explain why securing medical devices was important. And I think we no longer have to do that. Everybody understands the importance. Um, you know, a good old fashioned risk based prioritization is is a great place to start. But let me use a different example. There's a, a colleague of ours um, in a major health system in Atlanta. He does not have a security team. Um, he believes that security is everybody's job. And on his IT team, if you are the owner of that device or, you, or you're responsible for that network segment, that's part of your role. Um, now, I'm not saying that's the best way to do it for everybody. Um, but it's it's a unique approach that really takes ownership uh, down to the the level of every single person uh, for security, and you know really just understanding, you know, let's get the high value targets first. Let's let's hit the low hanging fruit. And I know that there's a lot of catchphrases and it sounds easier said than done. Um, but the last thing we want to do is just have analysis paralysis and, and do risk assessment after risk assessment and take no action. And so that's why, you know, we're moving more in the direction of managed services to where we don't just tell you what's wrong. We come in and help you fix it. If everything's an emergency, then literally nothing's an emergency, right? We, we have to start somewhere. And, and, and that's what both of our teams work together to, to do. Um, let's shift from, all right, we've talked about knowing your audience, you know, that's the kind of the soft skills, human component of knowing the environment you're actually working in. Let's talk about the mentality of a lot of healthcare, which is in most healthcare environments, triage is the rule in many of their sections, right? Beyond the emergency room, let's address the, the immediate issues and hopefully take a better practice long-term. So the first thing we have talked there, talk about there is that IT security is not healthcare security. 
right? Just because you have invested a lot of time and money and effort in IT systems, that's necessary, but not sufficient. So can you talk a little bit about the IT systems ha people have in place right now and where the, some of those gaps may be introduced? Sure. And, and it's really around um, understanding those workflows, understanding those communications, you know, going into to a tool like Scenarios and seeing what a device is talking to. That is, that is the first big step, right? Understanding what they are doing and then going through and, and figuring out what they should be talking to. And you can do some of that with automation, but a lot of it is good old fashioned understanding your clinical workflows. So using your tried and true approaches, you know, using your NIST foundations, uh, you know, your, your cyber uh, defense matrix, and you go through, you know, your, your data, your applications, your, your users, and you go from top to bottom and, and left to right. And you start to pick those things off and so that we can get something closer to a zero trust environment once you know what the devices are uh, what they should be talking to and then you start slimming down these other communications and figuring out if they are important and if they are configured properly um, you know it's it's there's no easy button here uh, that's the one thing we've learned for sure but we, we we start with the biggest rocks and then the next biggest and the next biggest until we till we get down to um, you know, trying to be able to secure them. I mean, and to your point, you cannot take an IT security uh, approach. You know, we we can't just block by default. We can't just put the most stringent rules in place because we have to allow for uh, that interoperability and for devices to be used when they need to. And right now, there's just been so many of out there in the wild communicating and, and i think you use the term and i'll probably use it again uh, medical devices are chatty uh once they connect they start talking to a lot of different things and iot devices are just as bad um and it's it's really understanding what ones are necessary and, and starting to weed those out i don't know if you want to expand on that chad yeah i actually want to expand with with a bit of an anecdote in the story because we can talk about that conceptually but until we actually see what's happening in the real world that can be a bit challenging. So what we've developed and what CTEC often helps us roll out and then, then address the findings is something called ADR or attack detection and response. And this came out of a very specific customer use case. Um, Marin Health, which is in the North Bay community, were standing up a brand new environment, right? They, their old uh, uh, hospital was seismically unstable, right? Meaning if there's an earthquake, it may collapse on itself. So they got to build a brand new facility, which is an outstanding opportunity to have. And as we were helping them segment their network, right? So making sure all communications between systems were you know, only what was necessary, not blocking by default, like John was saying, we started to realize that this pure, pristine network that wasn't treating patients yet, that shouldn't have anything on it, had old uh, malware bouncing around, right? 15 to 20 year old malware. And as we looked further and further, we started to find devices that should not be there, contractor laptops in particular. And what we realized at that point was we have this, this other product, kind of our flagship product I'll talk about as we go, but knowing what's on your network and using the chattiness of those devices to not only understand what's going on in the network, but identify malicious activity or unwanted activity is incredibly valuable. So we, we created with them this ADR technology that goes and passively monitors network traffic, meaning it doesn't interfere with traffic flow or performance or anything and then identifies active attacks that IT misses. It identifies unknown or unmanaged devices that should not be on the network. And then we work with folks like CTEC to make sure that we have a longer term strategy to one, stop those attacks in the moment, and then two, more, uh, uh, more uh, productively protect those attacks long-term. So it's not just saying, hey, IT systems miss a bunch of stuff. It's actually being able to take action on it. And that's what, what our two teams do together. And John, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I will tell you the the one thing I love about your product here is um, I, I am not drowning in alert fatigue, um, and and you are very good at picking up instead of sending twenty five alerts, you're very good at picking up if alert one and alert five and alert ten if those three combined are an indicator of compromise, picking that up and and uh, bringing that forward as opposed to just flooding us with alerts to try to figure it out. Yeah, and, and John's using the royal you there. I, I wish I could take credit for it, but that's our Scenario Live team that works with our technology. So our whole goal is to make sure that when we identify something, it is validated and we're not just sending you know, 10,000, 20,000 messages a day because our tool effectively becomes useless at that point. 
All right, so let, let's go next to something that the whole industry is starting to realize, which is inventory is not security. So when, uh, when device security really started to become a concern, probably what, five to seven years ago, kind of as you started to give them this and pioneer some of the practices, the thought was you can't secure what you can't see. Let's go do a full inventory and then we'll worry about security at the end of it. And we're at a stage now where it's starting to be accepted that inventory is absolutely necessary, right? It's important. You need to know what's on your environment, but it's also always changing. And if, unless you're taking security actions on top of that inventory, you're not really accomplishing much other than knowing what devices are where. So can you talk a little bit about the growth from inventory to security practices and then some of the knowledge and action that has come out of that? Absolutely. And you're correct. I need to take a personal hit on that because where this started was WannaCry. Uh, WannaCry hit. And um, across the industry, we were struggling to give the IT departments at the hospitals um, an inventory of their medical devices that had a Mac and an IP address that they could find on their network. So we had to figure out how to get a good solid inventory of medical devices that matched IT. Um, now, we're getting much better at that. But to your point, a medical device inventory is fluid. Devices come in and out on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Um, new devices uh, going out for service is just, it's incredibly fluid. So being able to say, if you can't see it, you can't secure it. I think we've, we've found a way to start moving past that because yes, we don't want to say, no, we no longer need an inventory. Um, it is a it is a absolutely necessary component, but in order to be scalable and in order to be really resilient, like we talk about as, as part of our services, you need to be able to take some of those actions, um, you know, based on on profiles, so that as devices come on, you might not necessarily know that particular one is there, but you see it's a communication that's potentially malicious. You're able to pick that up and you're able to take some action on it. Yeah, it, and and it, it's. It's a natural evolution of the technology that's helping do this, right? It, 10 years ago, this would have been pen and paper and clipboard, literally walking around the hospital. Well, guess what? Nurses are hiding infusion pumps all over the place. So they know exactly where to go in the moment they, they need them because they can kind of hard, be hard to find sometimes. So, so we're seeing the technology evolve beyond inventory um, to the security mindset. And there's a couple different ways it's done that, which uh, we'll be happy to talk about offline in more detail. Um, and, and to provide a little more insight into that, I do want to share an example that's popped up recently of inventory is not security. And this was a set of findings um, by the Scenario research team. Um, effectively, we went into a customer environment. And as we were in an environment, we started to notice um, all these hospital robots, in this, this case, Afon Tug, and they were communicating on the wire. And, and that wasn't a surprise. These are big multi-hundred pound robots that kind of wheel through the hospital and they have access to, to restricted areas that most people don't have. Um, and so they were incredibly well known. It was known these devices were there. You, you, you have to not be able to see, to not see these devices quite literally. But what we started to notice was not only were they physically there, but once you started to look at their activity on the wire, we started to see that they had access uh, um, and communication patterns that they shouldn't have had. And I'll not go into too much detail. We do have other webinars in a command center I can point you to if needed. Uh, um, just you know, pop a message in that question box. I'll, I'll gladly pass it along and I'll pass it along at the end of this presentation as well. But at the end of the day, what we found was not only were they, did they have technical access to areas they shouldn't have had, um, but they were able to control elevators. They were able to um, take photos of restricted areas. They were able to take photos of patients. Um, our team was able to remotely control them. That we were able to knock admins off. There's a whole variety of attacks that we were able to identify. Um, so it, it, it's a great example that just because you know something is there doesn't mean that it's secure. The other thing I want to point out is this example is not about these Athon tug robots. In fact, Athon responded to us. We both worked with CISA around these findings to make sure patches were rolled out before we disclosed it. Um, so kudos to CISA for making sure that there was a forum where we could communicate productively into Athon for getting these patches out. It's more about that we have millions and millions and millions of these devices that are connected that do have access, um, that do have security issues that we need to figure out a better way to help secure. And John, I'm not sure if you have any more insight you'd like to share about Jekyllbot 5 or if there's other examples. You mentioned WannaCry a little bit. Um, that really drive home the point of knowing something's there doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. No, no absolutely. And, and 
you know, no, I can't, I can't expand on Jekyll bot. I can't do justice that you can to it, but you know, literally knowing that you have uh, an inventory of devices does not even come close to securing it. You know, um, I, I had a customer uh, not too long ago that created a slide deck and he basically called it our journey from, um, you know, ignorance to non-compliance because his point was before we were blissfully ignorant, but now we know about stuff and we're non-compliant. And so, you know, that's that's the task. Now that we know it's there, now that we know what you have, what are the strategies to, to try to defend it? Yeah, and I think blissfully ignorant slash plausible deniability I think more and more people are realizing that's just not an angle they can take for much longer. So we are starting to see more and more action. That's not going to fly if the OCR comes in. I can tell you that much. <laughs> no, nope, not at all. So, um, so it, it's good to see that we've gotten to that point in education. We just need to help drive adoption a little bit better. Um, next, let's talk about ways that people can start to expand their IT workforce opportunities. And, and I'm going to position this in a, a, a certain way. Effectively, I was talking to a CISO. Uh, who said, I literally can't find people to hire. I'm a remote hospital. Um, there is not a lot of talent to pull from. And when we find talent, they're often you know, leaving the area anyway. And if, if they stay in the area, they can get a job that pays higher for remote work. And what this CISO did was actually go and go to the local casino and go to the local grocery store and say, who's your sharpest kind of most dedicated employee? We want to train them up. We want to give them a good IT job for two or three years. We know they're going to leave after that, but at least we'll get two or three good years out of them. And I think that's indicative of the, the entire healthcare industry as a whole, whether it's caregivers or IT folks. But what we're starting to see is there's a few emerging trends that are, are, are happening on the IT side that are helping fill those human gaps um, that have been left over the years. So, John, if you can talk a, a little bit about MSP and MSSPs and kind of what your team does to start this off, it'd be great. Sure. Um, sorry for the background noise here, but, um, you know, literally that's one of the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, there's a very, a very small workforce uh, of people in healthcare that have both, you know, medical device experience plus network plus security. And so we're all competing to find those, those black swans, if you will, that are out there. But what we bring to that is uh, now, regardless of if you have a full in-house program, or a hybrid where you have some of it outsourced and some in-house or fully outsourced between your biomed and IT and security. Um, what you can do with an MSSP is we bring to you the government governance, um, we bring to you, you know, policies, procedures, playbooks, and then we have a bench of, of talent. And so you don't need to hire 10 people that have 10 different specialties like, you know, a, a SOC analyst and incident response specialist. But what we can do is, is use the different people on our bench, two hours here, six hours there, 40 hours there. And so we can bring you all of those different talents for a much lower price than you can hire, recruit, train, and retain those people. Um, and we're finding that that's a, that's a trend that um, you know, really is a need in the industry because they just don't have the budget to hire five different people to handle all the different pieces. Yeah, and it's a reason why there's so much MSSP business out there. By the way, MSSP, Managed uh, Security Service Providers, we didn't clarify that. But there's a reason there's so much business out there because you can ramp up more quickly, you can keep headcount flowing through, um, and you can react much more quickly with, with greater expertise than most hospitals could ever imagine um, they could afford or find the right resources for. So it's an incredibly valuable set of offerings. Um, on the technology side, I always like to point out hospitals are working with a lot of products and a lot of vendors. And those products and vendors are, are really, really motivating, included scenario, to make sure that you're happy with our services because there are other options out there. And so what we're seeing is not only other MSSPs providing that human guidance you need for your entire program, but then the vendor specific team members like TAMs, technical account managers or CSMs, customer success managers are there to make sure that you're using products productively. So I, I always encourage folks to push really hard on your vendors to make sure that they're providing the expertise for the product that you need at a fair price. Um, push hard on our team as well. But these people are, are there to make sure that the product is successful in your environment and they work directly with MSSPs on a routine basis to make sure that the overall practice and the technology specific things are working out well. And then the final thing I, I, I recommend is get a little bit creative um, in your hiring. And this is a little bit easier with small hospitals than some of the bigger ones. 
but it may not be that you always need one full-time team member. And, and the best use case I've seen of this is I was talking with someone that works in Texas, which is a physically very large state. And he was a biomedical engineer and he serviced one different small hospital each day, right? He drove a hundred miles to the first one on Monday, hundred miles to the second one on Tuesday and so forth and would fly home direct uh, um, each, each Friday. And what that did was it gave the healthcare environments that expertise they needed at a much reduced cost. He was able to make a little bit more money because he was traveling and it was just a perfect use case. So as you're going through and you're thinking about, okay, we have our MSSP in place, but they may not cover X or Y or Z. If, you're, if you get a little more creative in your hiring and COVID has made us all do that, um, you can actually start to find really high levels of expertise that are often available at a lower rate than a full-time employee would be. Anything I missed there that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I was going to touch on COVID. Um, you know, COVID taught us all so that we can be more efficient remotely. Um, you know, I was just in Europe for my international residency for my MBA program. And we were talking to a few CEOs there that said, you know what, COVID has actually helped them in terms of IT and security because they now have access to a global workforce as opposed to a local workforce. And so leverage that, be creative, like Chad said, you know, find find the right fit. And, and there's a lot of guys out there that are semi-retired that only want to work 10 hours or 20 hours a week. So uh, definitely I encourage people to be creative there. Yep. Absolutely. All right, so moving on from that, let's talk a little bit about filling the gaps left by the IT and IoT divide. Um, and I'd like to do this by start this by talking a little bit about a data report that our team released back in January. And the long and short of that is we analyze a lot of devices, we analyze uh, uh, millions of devices in hundreds of environments, um, and we have this great anonymous data pool that we're able to go into and analyze. And as we go through that, we realize over half of those devices have uh, of IOMT and IoT devices have a critical risk, if not more than one. Um, things like segmentation, where you limit network traffic to only the communications that are required, no more, no less. We see that 67% of those devices see improvements with segmentation, and nine out of 10 critical risks are actually addressed by segmentation. Meaning if you have a device where you can't put a patch, you can't put endpoint protection, you could significantly cut down the risk to that device just by having a good segmentation policy. And then at the end of all of it, we talked earlier, nine out of 10 of those devices are also running non-Windows operating systems. So you have these devices where traditional IT uh, protections simply technically cannot protect them, but more modern approaches like segmenting out your network will provide additional security measures um, that will give you, you know, not perfect, uh, not 100% remediation, but mitigation to such a level that they're effectively impossible to attack. And if one device is attacked because it's segmented out, it can't spread within the healthcare environment. So for example, instead of losing all IV pumps in an attack, you might lose only two or three in a very specific ward and the other 997 will be untouched. So John, I, I know you've been around a, a long time. Can you talk a little bit about how segmentation has changed how healthcare environments are protecting uh, their, their, their devices? Absolutely. It, it, you know, this is a, a great, visual of what I call defense in depth, um, making making your network and your, your enterprise resilient. And for medical devices, that really seems to be where we need to get to. Um, if you can really effectively limit the devices and understand what communication should and shouldn't happen and actually start being able to enforce some of the policies uh, that tools like yours are able to, to pick out and, and understand if you can deploy them safely, um, you know, if you and you have a great feature that I think is is distinctive in what you do there, um, I'll leave that up to you to, to discuss if you want. But once you can achieve that segmentation, you are far more resilient. And if a device does get impacted, you're limiting that lateral movement and that spread of it because, like like we talked about, these devices are chatty. They talk to one another. And so once one gets hit, it just spreads laterally like wildfire. And that to me is, is the biggest benefit of segmentation is it starts to to really take that away. Um, you know, there's, there's there's no question to me that's the direction we need to go. Yeah, and I think resilience is the key word there, right? You want to protect your environments from storms, from hurricanes, from power outages. 
you also want to protect them from ransomware attacks and other cyber attacks. So you have to bundle those all, all together and think about how you're as resilient as possible to provide the highest level of care possible. All right, so there's one more checklist I want to go through, and this is how we can actually start to make security achievable. Because as we were talking about earlier, if everything's an emergency, you're just not going to get to anything. It's going to become an impossible task. So what we have to do as an industry is start to think about what are the, the baby steps or the small to medium sized steps that can build up to really, really big progress over time. And the first thing that, that is really important to acknowledge, and we've done it a couple of times already, is that healthcare is a unique environment, right? Every, every industry wants to say, hey, we're unique, we're unlike any others. Well, healthcare has that one unique factor that care is the priority, right? Revenue and profit are not the priority in healthcare. Care is the priority. And one thing that leads to is that hospitals rarely compete. You know, occasionally they do for elective surgeries in some cases, but the vast majority of the time, hospitals can share information back and forth, particularly when it comes to cybersecurity, because there isn't that direct financial co competition. So what we can see is if you start to join groups, um, I, I prefer the Cyber Health Working Group, it's just one I'm a member of, but there are plenty of groups out there that are semi-closed, meaning you need to apply, but there, there's a pretty low bar for getting in as long as you're not gonna go in and spam them. You can have very, very open discussions with peers that are in similar positions. So start to speak more freely in those semi-closed groups about how they, you can protect yourselves. The other thing I would recommend is start to adopt the ransomware communication styles of other industries. Right? Other industries come out and share their stories. They say, here's what we faced, um, here were the issues, here's how we handled it, and here's how we're protecting ourselves. Uh, Bear is a perfect example of this. They suffered a breach years ago that cost over a billion dollars. And to avoid fines, their CEO went on a roadshow where he said, here's exactly technically what happened, and here's what every other pharmaceutical uh, company should do. Start to share that information from the others, uh, like other industries do, because it can be really, really productive. Next is start having focused discussions with your teams, right? Ask your security teams, ask your IT teams, specifically, how are they addressing IoT security? Because almost every conversation, you're going to find someone who thinks the IT systems in place will actually protect the IoT devices, and that couldn't be further from the truth. truth. So start to, to ask those very pointed questions, and then start to investigate where are there gaps between your IT and IoT practices? We've talked about that a few times today. But ask team members, and don't do it in a shameful way. Don't say, hey, why haven't you done this yet? Ask, what systems do we have in place? What do we protect? And what, what may we be missing where we need to start to fill those gaps? Next is kind of tabletop response actions, right? If you suffer an attack, what are you going to do? Um, great example. We've heard many, many reports of people literally running around unplugging machines so that attacks don't spread to them. Well, when you're un unplugging machines in ICUs and emergency rooms, uh, um, there's bound to be human error that is going to impact patients. So start thinking, what are you going to do in those moments? Who are you going to call? And if, if your laptop is encrypted in a ransomware attack, do you actually have the, 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 the response folks on a piece of paper so you can actually pull out their, their number there, just as an example? So go through those exercises and make sure if there is an attack that takes your environment down, you know what you're going to do in the moment. Um, and of course, understand what your cybersecurity insurance covers. We're seeing that cybersecurity insurance is becoming harder and harder to get. It costs more and more, and it covers less and less. Just as an example, we mentioned Scripps earlier. They had over $100 million in costs. Cybersecurity insurance only covered about $6 million of those. It was, it was nearly worthless at that point. And then finally, investigate emerging best practices. We mentioned earlier, inventory is not security. There are work groups out there like the Cyber Health Working Group at intelligence.healthcare um, and push your vendors really hard. Ask them how they can increase team efficiency because I think what you'll find quite a bit is there are TAMs, there are CSMs, there are vendor specific experts that can probably in in increase your knowledge quite a bit. Uh, John, I hit a lot there, so I I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of these topics or any I may have missed. Ooh, there's a lot there. Um, let's start at the top, uh, collaboration. Uh, you know, um, everybody who knows me knows I'm a, I'm a student of SANS and SANS will teach you the offense informs the defense. And, and what that really means is, um, you know, like you said, talk, CISOs, talk to one another. If you're facing a problem, I guarantee you your, your cohorts and, and, and other facilities of similar size and, and, and makeup are as well. 
So discuss the strategies, discuss what you're seeing. Um, you know, and what we see often when an attack happens, these hospitals are quite often connected because doctors have privileges, right? They share information at multiple hospitals. So um, understand what your sustained connections are so that when you need to uh, respond to an incident, you know, you can know exactly which which tunnels you need to cut right away, uh, which sustained connections you have, um, and then going going into your uh, incident response plan. Um, two things that we see quite a bit in a lot of our um, uh, medical device security assessments: medical devices are rarely part of a SOC; they're rarely monitored twenty four seven, and they're rarely included um, in a formal incident response plan. So make sure that those couple of things are sewn up. Uh, make sure that medical devices are at the table. Uh, make sure biomed is there when you're talking about incident response because the last thing you want to do is have to run around the floor of the hospital and start unplugging land cables. Um, you know, you want to be able to have um, a solid plan in place um, for anything that you do. Cool. Awesome. And as the audience might, might be surprised, John and I can talk about this for hours on end. So if you do want to dive deeper into this, take a snapshot of this slide, at least give you just some things to think about. And we'll have our contact info here in just a little bit. So we can you can reach out to us. We'll gladly follow up and have a deeper discussion with you. So let's talk a little bit about how our teams work together to, to help all of our customers um, kind of address all these challenges we've been talking about. First, on the scenario side, um, we've built our products uh, um, only for healthcare. We only, we only take healthcare customers and therefore we roll them out with healthcare in mind. So I mentioned ADR earlier. Um, which is more like triage and emergency response. So full support, no noise. We go in, we identify those active attacks, unmanaged devices, et cetera, that other IT systems miss. Uh, the whole intent here is to give you a quick snapshot of your environment and capture those most critical issues that have to be addressed today. And then make sure we're working with, with folks like Synergistic to identify not only identify those, but address those in a very timely manner. More broadly, and based on the same engine that we've created, is our risk reduction technology, where we go through, um, based on those very chatty devices we've been talking about the whole, pro uh, the whole pod, uh, webinar, excuse me, we go through and we not only identify the devices, but we identify network maps, we identify who should be talking to who, or I should say what should be talking to what, and then do things like put segmentation rules in place that have already been tested based on that traffic to make sure that they cut down communication only to the devices that need communication. We have the additional benefit of things like service hardening or vendor access controls. So uh, for example, if GE gets hacked and you have a bunch of GE devices, just as an example, not to slander GE here, that their, their breach does not lead to being your breach because we, we make sure that we have the right vendor access controls in place. Uh, another example, Teslas we see on networks all the time because they're coming in, they're joining guest networks. Sometimes the, the, the doctors may configure them to jump on uh, um, non-guest networks. We want to make sure that Elon and his team, if they have a breach, it doesn't go and infect healthcare. So we have a, a much longer term uh, practice that we work with the CTEC team to roll out. And John, uh, oh, sorry, one, one more thing. I mentioned the ADR technology we have. What we've seen is we've had enough of a demand where people wanted a lightweight version of this that deployed quickly and got results quickly. So if you do want to test out ADR, um, we do have a no cost, no commitment deployment. We get it out there um, overnight in many cases. We deploy it for five days. We get a quick snapshot. Um, in 80% of the engagements we do, we find active malware that other systems have missed. And then in every single engagement we do, we find numerous critical risks that need to be addressed long term. The added benefit of this is we start to identify that entire footprint, that risk reduction technology I was talking about. So if you are in a healthcare environment, if you do want to start to understand what your environment looks like and some of the risks you need to address, we'll gladly uh, work with you on this and get a box out to you almost immediately uh, to get this deployed tomorrow. John, can you talk a little bit about uh, CTEC and how you all help build resilience? Sure. The next two slides, the, the first one's going to be, you know, this is what we do. And the next slide is going to be, this is how we do it. So um, what we do is we, we build resilience. I know I've said that a lot, you know, what does that mean? It just, it makes your system um, end to end uh, more hardened people process technology. We address all three. And, and really what we do is we take a minimalist approach. We're not just coming in to sell software. We're coming in to take a look at what you have, how it's working, how it's integrated, where your opportunities are, 
Um, and do you need governance? Do you need uh, incident response? You know, what are the pieces that you need? Uh, do you need a passive technology like scenario? And whatever pieces you need, we're able to help you with those recommendations. Um, and if you want, we're also able to just take that, fully deploy it, and manage it as a turnkey solution. And next one, we'll talk about process. This is how we do it. So, um, you know, Synergistec is, is known primarily for our, our risk assessments and compliance. Um, we, we, have to, we have to come in, uh, we, we have to take a look at your organization, ask the tough questions. Um, we, we really prefer to deploy a tool uh, like Scenario that we can deploy very quickly, get a quick snapshot, get a lot of data and, and help you understand what risks you really have. Uh, stage two is really building out your program development, making sure you have governance, making sure you have policies and procedures that address medical devices. Um, and then stage three moves into program management. If it's if if you're if you're game for that, you know, like a lot of people are, um, you can do that by buying a bucket of hours, or you can buy a turnkey managed program from us. And, uh, you know, we, we partner with uh, Scenario to get in there and see results really quickly and, and stand this up and get moving. Um, yeah, really, really fast. Cool. And John, we have a couple of questions coming in. I'm going to hold them off for just a second. So thanks everyone for submitting them. A couple other resources before we get to the Q&A part. Um, so I've mentioned a few things that are scenario specific throughout. So if you do want to learn more about Jekyllbot 5 and not only how we discover those vulnerabilities, but how we work with the manufacturer to address them and what those mean to the broader healthcare community, we do have uh, um, a command center as well as a video on the top left and bottom right there. I also mentioned the study that we released back in January. We'll re likely release another one in the coming months. Um, that's in the top right. That's our uh, state of healthcare IoT device security data report. And if you want to learn more about ADR and the, the, the rapid deployment of ADR and how we, how we can help you take a snapshot of your environment and understand those risks that are present today that you need to address, reach out to us directly, uh, scan that QR code. We'll be happy to talk about it. And John, do you want to talk about your podcast a little bit before we jump to Q&A? Yep. So Synergistic has a, a regular podcast called The Risk Perspective. Um, I've been on it, I think, once, uh, but it, we, we have a, a number of consultants and just fantastic leadership in this area. Um, you know, go, go out there, check it out. Uh, if you see some with Dave Bailey or Mac McMillan in particular, those guys just I feel like every conversation I have with them, I, I walk away feeling like I've learned more and contributed less. So uh, go check it out. Cool. Awesome. Uh, I have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first two are related to staffing. So I, I'm going to ask you these um, and I'll fill in any gaps, but I think you'll be able to handle them. Um, first of all, it's kind of an exasperated uh, question. How are you finding team members, right? It seems like there's too many cybersecurity needs and not enough people. So where does your team actually go? Do you, do you train people? Do you recruit them? What's that look like behind the scenes? You know, I've I found that we've been pretty lucky lately. You know, my, my personal experience and belief is that um, former biomeds that want to learn cybersecurity are the best for it because they understand the nuances of medical devices. Um, not to say that that some of us old cyber dogs can't learn medical because I sure did. I was in the, the energy sector prior. Uh, before the the bug bit for healthcare, um, but really, um, you know, I I look for biomeds that are doing work um, in IT, uh, looking for recent recent grads. Talk to a lot of uh, different schools that have programs. Talk to a lot of people at Sands um, and Cyber Vista and other training organizations that that we partner with and. When they, when they hear somebody that has an interest in security that knows med devices, uh, I, I'm on them. And so that's kind of one of my tricks. Yeah, I, I like to describe biomeds as almost like a Radio Shack crowd, right? They're really intelligent. They're really outgoing, a little bit nerdy, but at the end of the day, they do really, really good work. And so being able to take them and give them something to learn about, almost every one of them is like two thumbs up. Yes, I learned something new today. So it, it's a great pipeline you've built. The other thing I want to ask, and it's more about rolling those team members out, uh, um, how, what does a ramp up look like, both in terms of how quickly does it take for you to roll out your programs? Are people on site? Are they remote? Is it hybrid? You know, can you just talk through some of the logistics of you know, your typical engagement? Sure. So for us, we want to be showing traction within 30 days. And the critical piece for us is getting uh, technology like scenarios stood up quickly. Um, the faster we can get that stood up, 
the faster we can go through our interview questions on governance and process and procedure and workflows and come back together with the report. So if we can get that, um, you know, I want to see traction in 30 days. Uh, once we have the tool deployed, get some data, uh, it takes a couple of weeks to go through and do the risk assessment, get you the results, and then start building your program within 30 to 60 days is, is really our goal. Great. So you start today, you can have it ready by the NFL season. Uh, right? There you go. So what, one other question, and I'll take the first stab at this and let you fill out anything. Um, what are the most common actual risks we see today? So I'll, I'll rephrase it a little bit. Um, where should people most focus their efforts? And, and the answer I like to give to this is there was a Ponymon study that came out back in September of last year. And they asked people that had been attacked by ransomware, what the root causes were, what the outcomes were, et cetera. And they found that amongst the top root causes were medical devices, IoT devices. It was about 20% or so, um, right up there with phishing, cloud security, et cetera. The reason that medical devices stood out is because all the other uh, all the other uh, areas that were in the top 20% or so had known protections in place. You know how to secure your cloud environments. You know how to train and protect against phishing. Um, so ransomware, which is by far, at least in my mind, the most prevalent risk that you should focus on, the biggest chance for improvement is in the IoT security side. Then it, there's a slight chance in the API side and then a few others. But so focusing on all those IT, IoT devices that are relatively unmanaged and often not secure in any meaningful way um, is the biggest bang for the buck. So to answer the question directly, ransomware in my mind is the biggest concern. And then the biggest gap you can fill quickly is around the IoT device side. But John, what are your thoughts there? 100%, uh, I agree with you completely. Um, ransomware is the biggest concern. Um, the and, and all the methods you talked about, the one other thing I'll add additionally, uh, touched on earlier, those persistent connections understand what's connected to your network, understand when DICOM's being transmitted offsite, is that a known business associate? Is that your RAD reading service, radiology reading service, or is it a malicious IP address? So uh, between ransomware and understanding your persistent connections, I think are, are your biggest bang for the buck if I were to, to point to that two things. Yep, great answer. The other thing, and I'll leave everyone with this, that study also found that while fi finances, money, revenue, ransom payments are the motivating factor for a lot of these ransomware attackers, they are having noticeable and, and definitive impacts on patient safety, right? They're, they're causing longer lengths of stay. They're, they're causing more complications and surgeries. They're causing increased mortality rates when someone's attacked by ransomware. So while those attackers may have financial motives, they are having very real consequences for patients and that's starting to become more, more well-known. So with that, uh, John, thank you for joining us from the airport today. I know it's never fun to be delayed in travel, so really appreciate it. Many thanks to the audience. If you do have additional questions, please reach out to John, john.benedict at synergistic.com. Reach out to me directly, chad.homes at um, and we will gladly answer any other questions you have. Everyone have a great day. Thank you for joining us today. Take care. Thanks, everyone.